name is Jen and today I'd like to talk to you about swords or more specifically Anglo-Saxon swords or early Anglo-Saxon swords like this, pattern welded swords and this is mine and it's not based on anyone in particular but it is a fairly sort of generic representation of a 6th century sword. I just want to talk about it a little bit and about swords of the early Anglo-Saxon period. It's important to remember that a sword like this is purely a weapon. In Anglo-Saxon society is a symbol of a fighter. Um, other weapons such as a spear, an axe, a sax can also be used as a tool. But a sword like this is a, a symbol of you as a warrior. Um, in the poem Beowulf, it's important to note that when Beowulf is fighting the dragon, his sword bearers, his men at arms, um, you might call them his warriors, as they are shunning away from the, the dragon, uh, they are shying away even, they are shunned by Beowulf, they are shunned by society because they are supposed to be his sword bearers, they are expected to be warriors, they are expected to be fighters and that's why they own swords, that is a symbol of their bravery and who they are. So breaking the sword down into its components, it starts off with the, the blade and the blade is quite, there we go, quite longish and you'll notice it's fairly parallel and it goes down to not a super pointy point but still a point and a lot of times I've heard people say oh it's not designed for stabbing like that but it can still stab it can still go into people just because it's not got a very nasty sort of rapier type tip like a lot of later medieval early Tudory swords it still can do a lot of damage that way it's pattern welded and all that is is there's different steels different irons and it's almost think of it as plaiting hair plaiting different types of steel together hammering it together the original blade dimensions sometimes can be quite difficult to work out the swords themselves were often buried with their scabbards and over time with corrosion with soil types the scabbards and the blades would fuse together making it now very difficult to sort of measure. Uh, the narrowest blade that was found, so the top bit there is 39 millimeters and that was found in Mitcham. The widest one, however, is 76 millimeters and that is grave to it mucking. So there's a big difference between the narrowest blade and the widest blade that was found. The blade shapes as well, so mine is lenticular in shape and um, quite a lot were also this shape so they were lenticular and cross section there was also some that were flattened and most seem to have either this lenticular or flattened shape there was however some that had fullers as well and there's a very interesting one that had um, one fuller on one side but two on the other side and that was at Adlington Moving on now to the hilt, it's uh, this capital I shape and um, mine <laughs> need replacing but it's uh, organic, it's made from wood so the, the lower guard, the handle, the upper guard or wood and they've got this pommel here which is made from a copper alloy and these could be made from wood or they could be made from horn and just because it was made from a organic material it doesn't mean that it's lower status even some of the really high status graves the prince graves like taplow they had organic hilts so just because it is organic doesn't mean it is necessarily a low status item there is some absolutely beautiful um, organic hilts where there is gold bands nailed into them, especially uh, the one that I've put on screen now from Cumberland. Um, and that's actually got gold nails that holds in those gold bands. The 
pommels themselves are a lot smaller than the later sort of Viking Age pommels. And they're not designed to be almost like counterweights. Um, quite a few swords didn't have pommels at all. They just had these upper guards. And instead of the tang being peened over the pommel, what would happen is either it would be pommel, it would be peened onto the guard itself, or there would be a, a washer almost instead. And there's a few different types of pommels. So I've got this type here. Um, there was ones that looked a bit like this as well. And I've popped another couple more on screen. If you were somebody who didn't like the peening being seen over the pommel, you could get a pommel cap as well. A lot of them were discovered with Staffordshire Horde. Um, again, it's a, another way of decorating your sword. Swords very often were given by their lords to their retainers or their followers as a symbol that their follower was their swords person, their follower, their retainer, that they were fighting for them. And upon their death, their sword would be returned to their lord's family where then again it would be re-gifted out. And at times like that, what would happen was the, the pommel would be removed and it's thought that they would be buried. And uh, this is why we have finds of pommels that have been clearly safely removed. Um, they've been carefully removed, they've been deposited and the new person would have um, attached a, a new pommel onto it and then this becomes then their sword for their service until then they die and then the sword gets returned to them and the sword can see a good 100 perhaps 200 years of service it'll be passed down it'll be passed on from warrior to warrior and what will happen is the blade will be reused over and over again but the hilt the handle that will change but every time that changes, that gets refreshed, that gets renewed, is the blade will get a little bit shorter because as you're grinding this off um, and attaching a new handle, you'll have to take a little bit of the shoulders off of the tang just to make sure that you can fit your hand on it. So it would get a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter every single time until eventually it will probably um, not be very usable as a sword anymore. A lot of people say when they hold my sword, especially uh, reenactors that are used to holding blunt sort of uh, combat swords, is how front heavy a sword like this is. Uh, the point of balance is quite far towards the tip of the sword, whereas my uh, ones that I would use for fighting somebody their point of balance is much further back and it's because this is a real sword it is not something that is made to be used safely and people tend to forget that these are weapons that are meant to kill other humans they're they're not for putting on a display fight they're not meant for for showing off they're not meant for entertaining people and in real life, in Anglo-Saxon times, you don't want to be there fencing away with people. You want to be in there doing your job and moving on to the next person as quickly as possible. And having a sword where that weight is further forward so you can deliver that choppy blow a lot quicker, a lot more deadlier and efficiently would be a lot more important than being able to stand there like a more reenactment sports person would nowadays. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview onto the early Anglo-Saxon sword. If you've enjoyed this video, I really, really recommend that you um, buy this book. <laughs> it's really, really good. <laughs> it's about early Anglo-Saxon swords. And also please like, comment, share, and subscribe. It would really mean a lot to me. But my name has been Jen, and thank you ever so much for joining me today. Thank you and goodbye for now.